This is the top ten fallacies, mistaken beliefs, faulty reasoning, and unsound arguments in Judaism. Top ten. First one. The covenant of friendship that comes with Moshe, the anointed one of Isaiah 11, the descendant of King David, and promises of Jeremiah 31 refute a Messianic era. Rambam says in his Mishnah Torah that in the Messianic era, Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will therefore be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. He also says, at their time, <clears throat> at that time, there will be no hunger or war, no jealousy or rivalry, for the good will be plentiful and all delicacies available as dust. The entire occupation of the world will be only to know God. The people of Israel will be of great wisdom. They will perceive the esoteric truths and comprehend their creator's wisdom as is the capacity of man. Rambam made every bit of that up. That's not in the scripture. Nothing even close to that. But what do we have when Moshiach comes? Well, there's two covenants yet to be delivered. The covenant of Jeremiah 31, the covenant that God says he will write Torah on everyone's heart and everybody will heed him because he will forgive their sins and remember them no more. Sin forgiveness, that's what that covenant is. The other covenant comes with David. It's called the covenant of friendship. And it differs markedly from this time that Rambam's talking about. That's not in the scripture. Here's what's in the scripture. The covenant of friendship with Moshe, the descendant of King David. In the day of the Lord, when Moshe comes, this is where the words of Rambam should be if they were God's words. But they are not. They're Rambam's words. And that's not scripture. Here's what God promises in his covenant of friendship. He will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil and never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. There shall be no, they shall <clears throat> no more be carried off by famine. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. They shall know that the Lord their God is with them, and they, the house of Israel, are his people. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. Never defeated it and uprooted again. No longer the taunts of nations. Those are the highlights. God's coming to return to his temple. Of course, we know there's not one built. Elijah clears the way for him. It is Elijah that makes sure the temple gets built for his return. His presence shall rest over them, and when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. There's nothing in here about perfecting the world and the whole world being to know nothing but God. There's nothing like that. It's supposed to be a time of in the, the Messianic era where there's no sin. 
He just made it up. He's a religious man, and that would be the perfect world for him. But that's not in the scripture. I just read to you what the scripture said. That's what God says. This is what I'm going to do for you. Israel shall bloom again. I'm going to place my sanctuary there. So he already knows when he has this written in Ezekiel, he already knows the temple's not going to be there in the day of the Lord. And that's where he's, when he says, I'm coming back, return to my temple suddenly. But he's saying right here, I'm going to place it. I'm going to place it. He's going to use, he's going to use Moshe, the righteous servant, Elijah, the prophet like Moses, to clear the way for him. The Messianic era that is said to begin when the anointing wood comes, whom God calls his servant David, a shepherd. He's not King Moshe. That's another thing Rambam just made up. He's got two full chapters in the Mishnah Torah called King Moshe. All these things King Moshe is going to do and establish the Davidic covenant and dynasty. None of which is in the scripture. He's a shepherd. He's a teacher. Not a rabbi, he's a teacher. And he was believed by the early sages and rabbis of antiquity to be described in Isaiah 53. And the Babylon Talmud called him the leper scholar. So despite these two fabricated chapters of Rambam's mission of Torah on King Moshe, David is appointed the only shepherd not dismissed by God. One of the top ten things Judaism just refuses to acknowledge is that when Moshe comes, and he comes with the covenant of friendship, God has a reckoning and dismisses all of the shepherds and will only recognize Moshe. As a shepherd amongst the flock, not over, not ruling, not a king, among the flock. And I'm going to get to this shortly, you can't get around it, but I'm Moshe. God first spoke to me 13 years ago. And in this top 10 things, fallacies of Judaism, I'm going to get to better explanations of that. But recognize this. He gave me all this knowledge. This is how I know these things. The Messianic era fails to take into account God's reckoning and dismissal of the rabbis and having the glory of the people hurled to the ground by God of Isaiah 63 and utter destruction to the land of Malachi 3, if God's representation of Isaiah 53 is not recognized, who is the Moshiach of Isaiah 11. Now, I believe the realities of the day of the Lord, which is here, and I'll get to that, and the days of Moshiach will be much better than what Mr. Rambam had to say. Utopia is not here. And it doesn't fit humanity. Man is not made to live in utopia on earth. Period. It doesn't fit our nature. So utopia is not here. There will be no messianic air. You're not going to be the taunts of nations. God's going to set his temple amongst you. Never be uprooted again. And the land will flourish. Which of course it's already doing. It blooms again. Second, second, the top ten fallacies of Judaism. And this is this has got to be one of the biggest. The Holy Spirit, also known as the Spirit of the Holy God, also known as the angel of his presence, and also known as the angel of the Lord, is a person. Judaism does not recognize the Spirit of God as being a person. And as you'll see, that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. 
God created all things, including spirit and souls, that together form persons. The first person he created was the person of his spirit, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about it. You, I mean, your spirit is always with you. Okay, and he's got an angel of his presence. That means that angel is always with him. Do the same person as I'll get to. This is from Isaiah 63, verses 9 and 10. In all their troubles, he was troubled. And the angel of his presence delivered them. In his love and pity, he himself redeemed them. That's the angel of his presence. Raised them and exalted them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Then he became their enemy and himself made war against them. Well, we know the angel of his presence is a person. And the Holy Spirit is grieved. We, if you're an inanimate element of the unseen, you can't be grieved. To be grieved, you have to be a person. Now, I don't know why Judaism can't read that. And it's very important. Because, because it's why Judaism doesn't understand what a man in divine beings is. A host of the Lord's host, which I also will be getting to. There are still three men to come in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, two covenants, three more men, Moshiach, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. Each of these great men were righteous, and all three were servants of God. They're all righteous servants. One more man to come is God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. The Moshiach, the Moshiach, the anointed one. Well, this is where you find out his main anointment is to make the many righteous. Anointed to do what? Why is he the anointed? What's he going to do? Primarily, we see he's going to make the many righteous. So you got four righteous servants and only one description. God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is implicitly and explicitly all four men. Now that's a heck of a Moshiach if you think about it. He's God's righteous servant. He's Moshiach, descendant of uh, King David. He's Elijah and, and the prophet like Moses. I mean, you figure the last prophet of God is really going to be something. And what it really means is he's got a lot of things to do because he's got to handle the task, for instance, writing. Okay, that would, you would look to the prophet like Moses, write God's words because he wrote the Torah. God dictated it to him. Elijah, you want to find out things about heaven. The only man specifically taken to heaven and he returns. Well, what does he know? Well, he knows how angels are created, and I'm about to get to that. The sages knew you had to have a description of Moshiach, and it was Isaiah 53. They called Moshiach the leper scholar. Of course you had to have the description. Four righteous servants, one description. It has to, he has to be all four. Okay, I am Moshiach, God's righteous servant. Which means I'm also Elijah and the prophet like Moses. But my name is Keith. As Elijah, God has taught me all the matters of heaven I may need as a proof. Including how the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, was created. It is important for understanding how God is in his spirit. Again, our spirit's within us. We're in our spirit, our spirit's in us. Wherever God's presence is, his spirit is. Wherever God's presence is, the angel is. The short answer is this. I'm about to read it. God created an angel, and for his body, he made his own spirit the body of that angel. Doesn't have a human form and wings. Here's how he did it. 
He created a special soul because when, this is the Holy Spirit of God, his constant companion. So he's a person far above any of us. God creates a special soul and places it before his face and speaks the words, I am. But God does not use his voice. He becomes the person he is creating. He uses the childlike voice of an angelic person. He speaks to the angel as God and answers for the angel as the angel himself in a childlike voice. God simulates being this new person for ages and ages until he is perfect as God would have him be. Then God releases that special soul into his spirit from before his face with the breath of life. And the person of the Spirit of God was created, an angel whose body is the Spirit of the Holy God, the Holy Spirit. And he is a person. Angels are people, persons. God is always in him. God was him. God can always place the person of his spirit before his face and be him and speak as him and through him. And this is how God, my name, Hashem, is in the angel that was sent to guard the Israelites on the way to the promised land and in the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. You know, Moses it says, when Moses saw the burning bush, the angel of the Lord was in the bush, and God speaks. Well, that's how it happens. And nobody in Judaism knows this. First of all, they rule out that the Holy Spirit is even a person, and they, if they recognize an angel of his presence, I've never seen it. They're the same angel, the angel of God's presence, angel of the Lord. Despite the teaching of Judaism, to the contrary, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, is a person. If God's Holy Spirit can be grieved, he is a person. Only a person can be grieved. God is not spirit. He created all things, including spirits and souls, that together form persons. Persons of spirit, persons of angels, and the persons of human beings. God is absolute power and absolute knowledge. And he is a person. This is from um, Exodus 23, verses 20 through 22. I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him. For he will not pardon your offenses, since my name, since Hashem, is in him. Judaism doesn't even see it. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. The angel sent before the Israelites in the Exodus is the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit. Where God dwells and moves about as he did with Moses and the Israelites, his Holy Spirit is with him. In Isaiah 63, when the Israelites grieved his Holy Spirit, God became their enemy and himself made war against them. More proofs of the person of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel says in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, And he, God, Say to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and I heard what was being spoken to me. God is in his spirit. His spirit lit upon and entered Ezekiel, and upon entering him, he can now hear God's voice. He's a man in divine beings. He's got an angel, a Holy Spirit within him, and God. Both are persons, divine beings, plural. So when Jacob wrestles with an angel, you know, he said, I wrestle with a man of divine beings. 
Well, that's all it was. God just went to the man and said, I need you to go wrestle with this fellow. We're going to come with you. He's not an angel. The man was not an angel. He was just being directed and commanded what to do by God in his spirit within the man. They had entered him. Okay, so what happens in Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2? The anointed one, descendant of David, the Spirit of God alights upon him. Well, just as with Ezekiel, alights upon him and enters, and God is in his spirit. Moshe instantly becomes a man of divine beings. Further showing the person of the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel says, The presence of the Lord ascended from the midst of the city and stood on the hill east of the city. Now what do we have? Ezekiel has a spirit in him and God is in him. In this particular verse and chapter, uh, chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, God is showing that he is still one. He ascends. He leaves Ezekiel in the spirit. Rises over the walls of Jerusalem and goes and stands upon a hill, it says. East of the city. And then this. A spirit carried me away and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God to the exiled community in Chaldea. The spirit of God is taking Ezekiel in a vision. He's using a spirit to do it. Another spirit. So that means he's got to be a person. And God's showing why I am in my spirit. My spirit's in me. I'm still one. We are separate and apart from each other. We're just always together. It's like two clouds. The presence of God. Some elements of the unseen. It's his mind. It's where he feels he is. The Holy Spirit. Well, he's made of spirit. Elements of spirit. Like clouds, they have floated together and basically merged. But they're still separate. They're, they're completely different entities. But if the Spirit alights upon you, and anytime you see a prophet say God's words, the Spirit of God has lit upon and entered him, and God is in the Spirit. But they are separate. But, but here again is an example that the Holy Spirit is a person, the Spirit of God. Took Ezekiel on a vision. I don't know how Judaism misses it. So, you know, the power to take a man into a vision comes from God. Holy Spirit doesn't have power. The only entity in the unseen realm of God with power is God himself. He doesn't give power to angels. If they got to do something, he's behind it. So, Ezekiel says, When he returns and he says, and he tells the exiles all the things the Lord had shown him. The Lord had shown him. But it's the Spirit of God that took him on the vision. That he's telling the exiles, this is what the Lord. So basically the Lord became a part of the vision. Even though he's standing on a hill again, it was to show his oneness. And the separation between the two. These are the things as Elijah God taught me. I mean, he's been te he had to teach me the scripture. I was an atheist for 50 years. First thing he said was, uh, we need to go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. And I said, what's a Tanakh? I had never read the Bible. That was 13 years ago. Next. Third of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. A host of the Lord's host. 
Here's the story of Jacob. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket, so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he, the man, said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he, Jacob, answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And here's a man that just jumped on him and started wrestling with him. A man in divine beings, he says. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, what is your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, and this is now Elohim speaking. Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with beings divine and human. And have prevailed. We all know he didn't really prevail. That's just story, that part. You can't prevail against the power of God. It's absolute. And clearly, God's speaking. Everything speaks. He's in the spirit. He's in the man. And God just went to a fellow, found somebody sleeping by Jacob, said, wake up, I'm the God of this land. I have something for you to do. And the man could hear him speaking, because the Spirit of God had lit upon and entered him, and God is in his spirit. This is a teaching you can't find in Judaism. But you can find it from Elijah. Yet yeah, God's stories are always based on actual events and are used for many purposes such as conveying his teachings and establishing religious beliefs. In this story of the account of the night Jacob wrestled with a man and divine beings, Elohim said Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Jacob says, I have seen a divine being face to face, yet my life has been preserved. So he didn't really prevail. Let's just say he survived. And the divine beings of God and the Holy Spirit. And so when it says Jacob said he had seen a divine being, and yet he only saw the man, because you can't see God in the angel of his presence. We cannot see the unseen realm of God, the elements that it consists of. They had no form or image. Jacob saw a host of the Lord's hosts. And believe him to be a man and also a divine man. But here's a real good one. And you can't find this in Judaism. It's just three verses and any interpretation they have is wrong. Because they don't recognize the Holy Spirit as a person. They don't know what a man divine beings is. And it's how God communicates with the world. Every single prophet was a man in divine banks. Moshe, a man in divine banks. I'm a man in divine banks. But that doesn't make me an angel. I promise you, I'd be the last person you would associate as angelic. Not with my history. And here's, where, here's those three verses. The account of a man who identified himself to Joshua as a Gentile and a captain of the Lord's host in the book of Joshua, is the first and only time the scripture describes a host of the Lord's host. The captain of the Lord's host is clearly a host. Why only one time? How come Isaiah 63 is the only time you see the phrase, angel of his presence, and Holy Spirit? Isaiah 63. How come it's not in the Torah? When God said, I send my angel before you, don't disobey him. My name is in him. Why didn't he give a little clarification of that? And this that I'm about to read to you. It's, it's my proof. He hid it. It's what he did. He knew they wouldn't find it. And they wouldn't understand it. It's really cryptic. And that's what Isaiah 53 is. That is the craftiest writing of all time. And of course, I'm going to get to Isaiah 53. Okay, picking back up, I 
camera will only take a half an hour um, at a time. And I can't get it on the screen. Okay, let me find out where I was. Okay, number four. No, still on number three, a host. The account of a man who identified himself to Joshua as a Gentile and captain of the Lord's host in the book of Joshua is the first and only time the scripture describes the host of the Lord's host. And I mentioned that and the fact that it wasn't put into the Torah. And if you don't believe the Holy Spirit, the angel of God's presence, is a person, you never get it. And Judaism doesn't. And this is how God communicates with the world. Spirit enters into a man. God is in the spirit. The man can now hear God speak. And he can hear the Spirit speak, by the way. So, once, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him, drawn sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and asked him, Are you one of us, an Israelite, or of our enemies? He replied, No, I am captain of the Lord's host. Now I have come. Okay, so he's not an Israelite. He's a Gentile. Right after that, that's what we find out. Joshua threw himself face down to the ground and prostrating himself, said to him, What does my Lord command his servant? Well, the captain of the Lord's host answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So let's think about that. Joshua threw himself to the ground before a man with a drawn sword that had just told him that he was not an Israelite. And he said, What does my Lord command his servant? Well, man said he was a captain, a captain of the Lord's house. He didn't say he was the Lord. And the captain answers, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. These are the exact words God said to Moses at the burning bush. God is with this man, and he's speaking through him. God can speak through the man. That his spirit is entered and God is in his spirit. He can, he can use the man. Because he can control your thoughts. He can control your words and your physical movement. God is with the captain. And where God is, so is the angel of his presence. A man and a nine beings. Is what? He's a host of the Lord's host. He's hosting the Lord. He's hosting the Lord and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. He's the host. Come and be my guest. Take me and have me do whatever it is you need done. And the captain said, Now I have come. And is never mentioned in the scripture again. He is a harbinger of Moshe, God's righteous servant. A harbinger. And what is he? He's a Gentile. Gentile man and divine being, so is Moshe, described in Isaiah 53. And that would be me, every verse. God orchestrated my life for 50 years to make sure I fit every verse. A man of suffering, familiar with disease, wounds. I'll get to that. 
But he didn't speak to me until I was 50. And he did, he wanted me to be an atheist. He didn't want me to believe in God. He steered me away from it, is what he tells me. And he did a good job. Because I was adamant about it. I didn't have anything to do with religious people, religious affiliation, churches, synagogue, anything. Now, I had Jewish friends, but they were like me. They, they just didn't have anything to do with God. Just one part of uh, who we were. We just all went through bad times. It's just hard to believe anybody was up there, you know, pulling for us and things like that. Uh, but he wanted me to be a blank slate, a blank canvas where he could, you know, paint the knowledge he wanted me to have so that I could deliver these messages that I'm delivering. So he's a harbinger of the righteous servant. And... You know, that's the Gentile who arrives in the time to come of the prophecy of Jeremiah 31 in the day of the Lord. And I'm getting there. Isaiah 63 says God comes from Adam. That is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity. Adam was in uh, what is Jordan today. It's Gentile lands. It's where Elijah got taken up. I mean, he was over, uh, on the, he was east of the river Jordan. He was in Gentile lands when he got taken up. Elijah's a Gentile. He's an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. Which is Arab uh, and Assyrian. Well, they always were fighting over. It's Arab lands. East of the River Jordan. Ramoth Gilead. And he's a Tishbite. You can't find any Tishbites in any of the genealogies of the tribes that we have. You know, in Chronicles, Kings, uh, Samuel, you can, it's just not there. There's no Tishbites. And he's always referred to as Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant. He lives in Ramoth Gilead. He's a Gentile. And, and, again, I'm all for the righteous servants. I'm Elijah also. A Gentile. The harbinger. A Gentile. God's righteous servant. I'm reading it to you right now. A Gentile. He comes from Adam. God does. And, and he's got to have a visible representation. He's got to have a Moses. On the prophet like Moses, he's got to have a Moses. His visible representation. Moses, go tell the Israelites this. And uh, also, you better write it down. Write Leviticus down. Now go and tell them all that. He doesn't say God told him to write it down, but we have it, so he must have told him to write it down. God dictated everything I'm reading to you. This, this comes from the book, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. The first book, he's had me write two. It's about 285 pages worth. It's not just Isaiah 53. It's all this information, too. And it's got everything you ever want to know about Isaiah 53. Finally. Somebody who knows how to interpret it. And it would, and the only way you can interpret it, you have to be that man. It's written like that. It's crafty writing. God had Isaiah write like that. And it's, it's also a snare for the Christians with the words that he uses. Uh, the only thing that comes in second to it is Malachi 3. Okay, this would be uh, number four of the top ten. God's return in this day of the Lord. It's here. You should be looking for Elijah, and most particularly Elijah, since he clears the way for the Lord. And if he's not successful in his purpose, which is the same purpose that might prosper of Isaiah 53, you know, Isaiah 53 is representing Elijah more than anybody. If you had to pick somebody, but you got to have a guy today. I mean, clearly, the original Elijah uh, and uh, David or Moses, they're not coming back. Prophet like Moses, okay. What did Moses do? He wrote and spoke God's words to the Jewish people, the Israelites. This is what I'm doing. David brings the reckoning and dismissal, by the way. 
with the covenant of friendship. He, he doesn't clear the way. Elijah does. Judaism got that wrong. And why? Ram, bam, King Moshe. King Moshe must build the temple, and then we will know it's truly him. Now, now you're going to know it from this. And failure to recognize who I am brings nothing but trouble. Your glory will be hurled to the ground. That's from 63, chapter 63 of Isaiah. And in Malachi 3, God brings utter destruction to the land if that temple's not built. That's clearing the way for him. So, this is God's return in this day of the Lord. How do we know this is the day of the Lord? Again, Judaism, I've never heard anybody in Judaism, any rabbi, speak of what I'm about to tell you. This is how we know. It begins with Jeremiah 31. When God says, see a time is coming, three times, summarizing, summarizing those, the land blooms again. The cities are restored and Jerusalem is rebuilt to a size at least as large as in antiquity. And it's a major metropolitan area today, much larger than anything in antiquity. Jerusalem is rebuilt to at least its size uh, it is today. And see, a time is coming, God will make a new covenant with you. That's the covenant of sin and forgiveness that begins, I will make a new covenant with you and write Torah on your hearts. How does he write Torah on your hearts? He forgives all your sins. What else does that do? Makes you a holy seed. When did he do this before? For the exiles, the Syrian Babylon exiles. He forgave their sins. Isaiah wrote those. Jeremiah writes it for the dispersal, the Roman dispersal. Isaiah wrote it for the exiles. And what did they do? They built the second temple. What do we know? We need another temple. This new covenant of sin forgiveness makes the Jews a holy seed again today, in this day of the Lord. To build the third temple. An eternal temple. Never be defeated and dispersed again. It won't be destroyed. So the land lay desolate after uh, Rome destroyed Jerusalem and basically the promised land. And executed hundreds of thousands of Jews. They fled. Fled primarily to Europe. And the land lay desolate for over 2,000 years. And Jeremiah's talking about, well, the land's got to bloom again. And the cities restored, Jerusalem rebuilt. What's he saying? When y'all come back, I come back. When you come back, I'm going to come back. That's all there is to it. You don't have to have sin. Yeah, a lot of rabbis say, uh, we all have to be sin free. Or it's the next mitzvah. So you've got to have a lot of observant Jews that brings God. No. All you got to do is return. He comes with sin forgiveness. Why do you have to all be sinless? And observant Jews, you don't. Why does he have somebody making everybody righteous? And you know what that is? If you're sin free, that's me telling you, honor God for, for just clearing your slate of any sins. Honor him and you come back to Judaism or you come to it for the first time. Return to synagogue. Show God how much you appreciate him coming to live with you again and forgiving all your sins and putting his house amongst you eternally, promising you, you will never be defeated and dispersed again. No longer be the taunts of nations. No, it's not utopia. It's not heaven on earth. And the scripture doesn't, to the extent you can find a story like they shall turn their swords into plowshares. That's just for the people of antiquity. They couldn't read. They're ignorant. They like stories read to them. They need to have hope in their lives too. And God would write some, he, he'd have his prophets write some things like that. But there's nothing from God. If you want to hear what God says, it's his covenant of friendship. And all that's happened today. This is it. Started in 1948 when the Jews returned and created Israel. 
The land does blend today. It's incredibly beautiful. It's incredible what they can do with water. <laughs> and uh, the cities, new, vibrant. Um, as a country, they rank in the top ten in everything you want a country to be. And just about any survey you see. A happy, friendly people. But always, but always under the threat of destruction in the Middle East. So, this is a day, new covenant. Okay, where is it? Where is it? Where, where do we, how do we know it's here? Well, somebody's got to announce it. Who announced the first covenant? Prophet like Moses. Who's the messenger that comes with the angel of the covenant that you desire? There's only two, the one you, and one comes with David. The other comes, that's the angel of the covenant you desire. It's the covenant of sin and forgiveness of Jeremiah 31. Who else is there? Elijah, the messenger. Now what else do we know? Elijah's going to know the angel because he's been in heaven for over 2,000 years. He delivers it. And of course, again, he's just one of four righteous servants, all of which, all of which I am. I'm all four. This basically means I handle his role as messenger, and it's in the books. I've got to get them published. And when they're published, the message is delivered. Your sin's free. And, of course, when God comes, also contrary to the Messianic era, God says, I'm coming with vengeance. I pass the cup of my wrath, the bowl of reading from you, my people, to those who told you to get down on the ground and walk all over you. That would be Christianity who took your book and told you you didn't know how to read it. He comes with vengeance. He doesn't come to affect the world. He doesn't come to have the world speak Hebrew. Rambam misinterpreted that. Another error by the sages and rabbis. Well, by the rabbis anyway. So where is this covenant? So anyway, since we know the New Covenant is here, we go to Malachi 3. That's the next time we see it. And that is where the day of the Lord is announced. God says, I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way, and I'm going to return to my temple suddenly, just as soon as it's built. Suddenly, and the angel of the covenant you desire is on the way. So that's where you go. That's how you know this is the day of the Lord, and that see a time is coming three times means the time he's referring to is the day of the Lord. It seems so simple. Judaism doesn't get it. They don't teach it. Well, the rabbis who were dismissed, I bring the reckoning. I'm David. And they are dismissed. I'm the only shepherd, a teacher, God recognizes. That means they don't go into the scroll of remembrance. That means they don't go to the heaven that God is creating with the name Israel shall endure. The only way they're going to get out from being dismissed, they're going to have to teach the same things I'm teaching, which is what I'll be doing. That's how I'm a shepherd. I'm going to be teaching, teaching these matters of the two books God dictated to me. They're going to have to do it themselves. They're going to have to tell the flock. We've had ten fallacies that really, really God is unhappy with, particularly the Messianic era. He never said anything like that. False teachings. But they're going to have to teach these matters if they want to uh, remove themselves from being dismissed and get entered into the scroll of remembrance. And that's even acknowledging that they're sin-free and that they're observant Jews. Doesn't matter. They fall in with those who do not heed and revere the Lord. And they're going to have to prove they do by teaching these books. By the way, you can find them at keithmccarty, mccarty.wordpress.com. And I've got a YouTube uh, video on every single chapter from both books. It's about 45, about 45 YouTube uh, chapters, but there's 50 chapters in the first book and 16 in the second book. Okay, and I just mentioned, who does the angel give the covenant to for delivery? Well, it's the messenger Elijah. That's why he said, God says, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. So 
So who does not fear? Every verse of Isaiah 53 to be God's visible representation in this day of the Lord that will clear the way for him by having the third temple built for his return to dwell amongst his people forever and deliver the last two covenants. Jesus and the Jewish people as Israel, which is the common teaching in Judaism today that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as Israel. Those two don't even enter into the conversation because Isaiah 53 is God's visible representation in the day of the Lord. And of course, Judaism doesn't know that. Jews for Judaism certainly doesn't. They believe in this messianic era, this utopia on earth. That's what they base their, their, their reasoning on, the grounds for their argument that 53 is Israel, based on something that's never going to happen, based on Rambam's words, not God's. And Toby is singer of Outreach Judaism. He says, verse 10, <laughs> where it says, God chose to crush this man with disease, that he would offer himself for guilt, and I'm going to get to that. I mean, he just he just flew off the handle and said, that's a guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. He, he, he went the Christian route. Let's go to human sacrifice. And he, none of that makes any sense. It's an absolute absurdity. And I got plenty of writings on it. But basically he said everybody murdered, murdered in the Holocaust were a guilt offering. A guilt offering, which is for like uh, destroying religious objects or not paying a debt, theft, something like that, uh, of, a, of a ram. And of course they were all blemished. I mean, at least the Christians said they got their unblemished lamb of God. Well, he can't be in there either because he's crushed with disease. He's familiar with disease. He can't be in Isaiah 53. Anyway. Oh, and uh, as for you Christians, guess what? He's a Gentile. There's a harbinger of him, the captain of the Lord's host. He's a Gentile. And God comes from Adam, Gentile lands, and of the peoples, no Jew is with him. He comes with a Gentile. Jesus is a Jew. Moshiach of Isaiah 11, described in Isaiah 53, is a Gentile. A shepherd. Verse five, and this is the last one I'm going to get to for this tape. I'm going to get half. I'm going to get uh, five of the first ten. This has to do with this phrases in Isaiah 53. Remember, I told you how crafty it's written. This was to draw the Gentiles in. God knew they were going to create a Jesus. And he also knew whether they did or not, they were going to take your book. Just as the Muslims uh, just plagiarized it. Wasn't it because of our sins? What is that? Julian does not recognize the connection between Isaiah 53 and the books of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Malachi. Or understand that Isaiah 53 describes a man for the day of the Lord, God's visible representation, speaking and writing his words as Moses did. Judaism today teaches that God's righteous servants the Jewish people as one man, Israel. As I just mentioned, based on faulty arguments, fallacies regarding the Holocaust and the guilt offering and the Messianic era, which will never occur. That's Rambam's word. It's not God's word. It's actually absurd when you read what Rambam says to think that's going to happen. That's the first thing I have on this videotape. You think the world's going to turn into that and the world's going to be solely to know God and everybody's going to be perfected. There'll be no sin. Everybody speaks Hebrew. Uh, food will be for everybody. Delicacy such, such as the dust itself. I mean, he's just making stuff up. Isaiah 53, 5 reads, But he was wounded because of our sins, 
crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole. And by his bruises, we were healed. This is the crafty writing. What does that mean? Judaism doesn't believe there's vicarious suffering because God says every man is responsible for his own sin. No other man can die or take it for him. And they're clear on that, and especially if you ask them about Jesus, well, no, that, couldn't, that, that can't happen. Well, that human sacrifice can't happen. God's not a God. He's not a man God, an Aztec God, that would commit, <laughs> commit human sacrifice, much less accept it. The book of Ezekiel, and I promise you, Judaism doesn't have a clue about this, and you can't really know if you're not the man going through it. Here's the answer. The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. Ezekiel is told he will bear the punishment for the sin. I mean, that's what the punishment would be for. It doesn't say for sin, but you can see how these same words, wounded for our sins, start getting built in. Ezekiel is told he will bear the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah, and he is punished, chastised, maltreated, bruised, and crushed. These are the words of Isaiah 53. It's not just verse 5. To make him suitable to be a prophet to the Assyria Babylon exiles and speak the words of God he has given during the ordeal and the anguish of it. It is to remove his self-will and make him humble to God and the Jewish people. And it's done in God's power and his words. Just like the righteous servant. Except Ezekiel is not crushed with disease and does not make himself an offering for guilt. God just seizes him. This is what Ezekiel says. And by the way, I call it God's boot camp. And he will hurt you. He, he'll maltreat you. He'll hurt your feelings. He'll draw emotion and anger from you all day long. Just to change you, break your will, make you humble. Um, like I said, it's like a boot camp. It's like uh, breaking a wild horse. I mean, you know, they beat on a wild horse until he stops bucking. You know, it's being a Marine in a boot camp and having a sergeant who's allowed to beat you with a big stick if he wants to. And who can read your mind, by the way. Here's what Ezekiel said, a spirit seized me and I went in the bitterness and fury of my spirit in the hand of God. Now he's in the hand of God. Why is he bitter and furious? Because when God punishes, maltreats, chastises, bruises, and crushes you, doesn't matter that it's God. You're furious and you're bitter. I mean, he's very good at these things. And again, he's just changing. It's for, he, he'll tell you, well, it's for you. <laughs> of course, I always got some kind of argument. that I don't care to have it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't want it. He says, you need it. And here's what God says to Ezekiel. I will make your face as hard as theirs. He's talking about the, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites. I will make your face as hard as theirs, and your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them, and do not be dismayed by them. And then God maltreats and punishes him for the punishment of the house of Israel and Judah for their sins. For 430 days he is pinned to the ground with the power of God, binding, binding his arms behind his back as though with handcuffs. For 390 days on one side, he's not allowed to flip over to the other side. I can't get to a night without flipping over. 390 days. For the punishment of the house of Israel and 40 more days for the punishment of the house of, of Judah. Now he's a priestly man. Do you know how mad you would be to know you're getting punished for the sins of the people you've been trying to stop sinning? Your whole So he's pinned to the ground, which was called bruising and crushing, by the way. 
God's power can pin you to the ground. He's shown me. He pinned me down for five days one time because I, um, I just say I sassed him. Let's <laughs> see, I said something. I got angry and I yelled at him. He said he wants me to tell you. He, I said, he was so mad. He said, Keith, I am God. And I said, God, I am Keith. <laughs> And his invisible power slammed me to the ground with such force it just about knocked me unconscious. And I didn't get to get up except for the bathroom and eating for five days. He did take me on very interesting visions, but uh, just slammed me to the ground. It's not that it wasn't the last time he slammed me to the ground. And usually he'll do it when you least expect it. Now he did it to me then, and I should have expected it. But usually he'll just do it when everything just seems fine and nice and things are going pretty good. And just out of nowhere, slam you to the ground. Yeah, it hurts your feelings. That's maltreatment. But that's what all these words are about in 53. God's boot camp. And he does it. He does it in his power. Which envelops me. I mean, I always know, you know, and there's a heaviness around me and my body. You know, I don't just hear his words. I mean, I know he's right here with me. So, for 430 days, pinned to the ground, crushed and bruised, eating nothing but bread, chastised by the words of God. Um, there, there's one example of that. The Assyrian Babylonian exiles were made whole and healed only if they listened to him. The teachings of Ezekiel of repentance and restitution. God, God's righteous servant, which is me, is wounded, crushed, and chastised by the world, based on the verses, throughout his life with persistent hardships and troubles, grievously affected, especially by disease, and severely injured at one time or another. A man of many bruises and scars, stripes. These are the qualities that identify him is God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous as a man of suffering familiar with disease. None of which was describes Jesus, by the way. None of it. I mean, I'm the antithesis of Jesus. You know, I'm an atheist. I've been through all these troubles. been through all these wounds. I've been uh, shot through the abdomen. Uh, I've had three cancers, skin cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer, which is my proof of 5310. I offer for myself for guilt. I'm going to read this to you first and then follow up on that. My proof that I did do and offer myself for guilt because it says God chose to crush him with disease that if he offered himself for guilt, he, he would receive long life. I was told after I survived the colon cancer that uh, it had spread to my lungs. They gave me about one month to live, said it was untreatable, there's nothing they could do, it's too advanced. I said, you know, I said, what does all that mean? You're not going to treat him? They said, no, you're just going to die, and you're going to die soon. And that was when the planes hit New York 20 years ago. And I've never seen a doctor since. I walked out of there, and I never came back. No treatment. Nothing. I was crushed with sea. Crushed my life. I quit working everything. Just waiting to die. And then I never died. I've been getting along a lot. And he still hadn't spoken to me. I still didn't know about all this. He said, well, how did you offer yourself for guilt? He told me I did. <laughs> he said, you would have if I had asked you. Because you didn't even know what Isaiah, the book Isaiah was. And I needed to get started. He said, you, believe me, you're going to say yes. <laughs> and I would have because it gave me a long life. I was just thought I was going to die. But he didn't talk to me for about nine years after that. I guess that's about right. Well, I was like 41 or 43 years old, and I was 50 when he spoke to me. I'm 63 today. So, I, I've had this really rough and tumble life. Lots of all these things that, that fit into the verses. Then, to make me suitable for his purposes... 
God and his power and words punish me, chastise me, maltreat me, crush me, and bruise me in what we call the fire of refinement. To make my face as hard as the Jewish people. Remember, I'm a Gentile. My forehead is brazen as theirs. My forehead like adamant. Basically meaning, you know, don't push me too far. <laughs> I'm a man of divine beings, but I'm still a man. As brazen as theirs, uh, harder than flint, so that I will not fear them. I won't be embarrassed to go in front of them and say, yeah, I'm a Gentile, and I am Moshe, and I am, described in Isaiah 53. And I am Elijah and the prophet like Moses. In other words, you know, just going and telling somebody that, you know, you got to be prepared for that. You got to you got to have your emotions under control because you can imagine the responses I'm going to get, and it's already happened. What's one of the uh, second verse? I think a third verse. He was shunned, despised by men, accounted, <clears throat> plagued, etc., etc. See, nobody even thinks about that. Come, Moshe, come. The rabbis say, which. You know, they're going to be dismissed and reckoned with, so I don't know why they're calling on me. But uh, it's like they've given no thought to those words. What, what does it mean? Well, they say, well, 53 is not Moshe. Well, yes, he is. The anointed one, what, what's he anointed of in 11? Well, we don't find out to 53. To make the many righteous. And as it turns out, many other tasks. So, and how does he do that? Well, he breaks me, just like a wild horse, just like a cadet. To be me, he just breaks you down. It's relentless. He doesn't sleep, which means I don't get to sleep much. This has been going on 13 years. It started out fairly slow, but every year it's gotten more intense. As he says, it just takes more to anger you. It takes more to hurt your feelings, because you're ready for everything now. He says, I've got to be, I got to be more extreme. It's been a tough time. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everybody would like to live with God and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it's not near as much fun as you think. <laughs> you wouldn't pass it up. And he'd always say I'm the luckiest person, you know, of all times, or at least since the Bible closed. But, uh, you know, I've begged for death a thousand times and I've cursed him a thousand times. And God says, and Keith, you did it face to face. Which is just him directing me in his power to a place in the room where he says, this is where my presence is for us to talk today. That's face to face. Friend to friend. And friend to friend, what does that mean? I can say anything I want. Unless I cross the line and all of a sudden I slam to the ground. <laughs> you got to be a little careful. He's pretty forgiving. And again, it's soon to remove my self-will. I don't make any decisions. I'm not responsible for anything. He controls my thoughts, my words, my physical movement. Okay, I'm going to pick up on uh, what I believe to be number six. I don't have it numbered uh, on, on another video because this has already gone over an hour. Uh, and number six is Isaiah 53 is a story of righteousness. And it's, it's very good. It, it follows up on all these, uh, this, this God's boot camp and the, the fire of refinement. It, it clarifies it even more as to, you know, why Isaiah 53, it's not some song. That's what, that's, that's what Judaism teaches. It's a song. So by the way, all that started with a Christian. But um, uh, regarding the Jewish people and what they've been through in their history, but none of it works. In other words, it's an absurdity. It's ridiculous. And I find it hard to believe that people like Michael Skoback, Jews for Judaism, Toby Singer, Outright Judaism, I find it hard to believe they truly believe their own words because their arguments are fallacies. They're absolutely absurdities. And uh, God, God put them in the book. He dictated what he wanted me to say, what he wanted uh, to say about what they do and what they teach and how they teach it and how many errors and problems and uh, lack of reasoning. That would really be Toby's signal. 
uh, that they exhibit. Uh, it's his writings. So if you, you see the YouTube and I'm saying all these things, they're coming straight from God through me. That's where they come from. That's his opinion of them, not mine. Although I had to admit, after reading the reasoning and their arguments and seeing how uh, many fallacies that he's top ten in Judaism, uh, I'm not that impressed with him. I'm not impressed, you know, and I was an atheist for 50 years. But I'm not impressed with him. But, you know, I have to remember God taught me a blank slate, a blank canvas, a painting of uh, how he wants me to understand him, his spirit, the unseen realm, and his creation and his people. Everything in my life is about the Jewish people. And uh, I'm still not clear if he's going to have, sometimes he tells me I want to convert Orthodox in Jerusalem. And sometimes he said I'm still thinking about it. Which is ridiculous because he doesn't do that. He always knows exactly what's going to happen. So he's just kind of leaving me dangling a little bit. You know, I'm not on the executive committee. You know, I, I, I don't get in on, hey, let's, let's do this. I, I don't offer those kind of things. He tells me what we're going to do from waking up to going to sleep to what I'm going to eat to what I'm going to read to what I'm going to watch on TV uh, to what I'm going to do during the day. I don't control anything. So I'll be picking up with Isaiah 53. It's a story of righteousness. And that'll be, uh, it'll be U2 volume, uh, the details, uh, two of two of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. Thanks for listening.